playing for us. Let us get back into our study of the doctrine of the Father, God the Father. And so let's take our Bibles and go to the book of 1 John chapter 4, a familiar chapter and a couple familiar verses. Uh, we began a couple weeks ago looking at the moral attributes of God, those attributes which help His creation identify with His universal dealings with creation. Uh, his holiness is what we began with uh, a couple weeks ago. And uh, we looked at some attributes connected to the holiness of God. God is the perfection of holiness. He is perfect in all His ways. His justice, His righteousness is perfect in all His ways. And truth, I attach truth also to the concept of the holiness of God. God is the fountain, the source of all truth. And of course, He has invested that truth for our benefit in His Word, God's Word. Uh, we can trust this book implicitly for everything pertaining to life, faith, and godliness. It is authoritative. There is no error in this book whatsoever. None. Even when this book speaks of medical matters, scientific matters, historical matters, all of that, philosophical matters, whatever it might be, this book is truth. Because it was penned, ultimately, by the God of truth. And so we can bank on everything in this book right here. So we looked at that a couple of weeks ago. I'd like to begin to look at the second of the moral attributes of God. And as I mentioned when we first started this particular segment, I was simply going to take two moral attributes and from that branch out to other moral attributes of God. The first being holiness, the second being love. God is the perfection of love. And then, of course, from that we're going to look at some independent or, or related uh, at moral attributes of God. But in 1 John, 1 John chapter 4, twice, twice in 1 John chapter 4, the Bible states that God is love. Verse 8, verse 8, he says, He that loveth not knoweth not God. Why? For God is love. And then again in verse 16, and we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And so God is the perfection of love. In your notes there, we have kind of a, a box, if you will, speaking of the love of God and several points within that. Number one, in your notes, it says the love of God is the only power capable of satisfying the demands of of His holiness. The holiness of God and the love of God are inextricably linked together. They are not counter to one another. They do not in any way conflict with each other. It is that love of God that enables Him to satisfy the holy demands that He has. And Romans chapter 5, verse 8 gives us uh, a scripture relating to that, but God commendeth or showed His love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So the holiness of God is introduced when that word sin is brought into the picture. Something has got to be done about sin. It cannot be ignored. God does not ignore sin. God is incapable of ignoring sin. His holiness demands justice. But it is His love that enables that holiness to be satisfied through the merits of another, Jesus Christ. So, the love of God is the only power capable of satisfying the demands of His holiness. Number two, the love of God is extended by His mercy and His grace. Now, we're going to look at those two independently in a moment. 
But in Ephesians chapter 2, let's take a quick peek here at a couple passages. Ephesians chapter 2. And then again, we're going to look at another passage in 2 Thessalonians. But in Ephesians chapter 2 and in verse 4, the Bible says, But God, who is rich in mercy for His great love, wherewith He loved us. And he goes on to explain what that rich mercy has afforded us. But he's connecting the mercy of God, the richness of that mercy, with His great love. And then 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 16, where Paul writes, Now our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work, word and work. And so, uh, again, the love of God, it is from the love of God that the mercy of God flows and from which the grace of God flows. We're going to explain the difference. Similar words, similar sense, but they are not synonymous. They are, not, they are, they are different. There are some significant differences uh, between God's grace and and his mercy. Number three in your notes there, the love of God is extended to all mankind. Uh, you can't get more basic than John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is a fundamental truth. As an independent, Bible-believing, fundamental Baptist, I believe Jesus Christ died for the whole world, not just a select few. That His sacrifice is sufficient for anyone, whosoever, will call upon His name. Now, God knows who is going to. And no one comes, but they are called. I understand that. We're going to save probably this, all the intricate workings that, that man heaps upon God's doctrine trying to confuse the matter. Uh, well, actually, what they're trying to do is explain it, but what they end up doing is confusing it. Because the bottom line is this. God is infinite in His wisdom and power. We are finite. And the moment we try to step outside our uh, sphere of understanding and try to explain God in ways that we think make better sense to us, we are treading on thin ice. It is important to take God's Word at face value and not try to superimpose upon it something that makes more sense to us. God says Jesus died for the world. He did not put some qualifier in there that says, well, by world, I'm only meaning the elect. He said the world. And when He uses the word whosoever, he's not again qualifying that word to limit it. It is an unlimited, universal atonement for the world. But it is only advantageous for those who make, take advantage of it by faith. When we get to the doctrine of salvation, we're going to explore this in far greater detail. We're going to look at the the battle, the conflict between concepts like Calvinism and Arminianism. And if you say, well, which are you? I am neither, actually. I hold to that which is true. And if one or two of these men, either of these men are in alignment with Scripture, to that degree, I agree with them. But where they diverge from that, I'm in disagreement with them. But I will try to explain that, Lord willing, in the weeks to come when we get to the doctrine of salvation. Um, again, everything what we want to do is, is make sure that we can anchor it in the literal interpretation of Scripture. The literal interpretation of Scripture is, is key. Okay, number four. The love of God is the source of all true love. All true love. Um, it is described in detail in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we will not turn there. 
But 1 Corinthians 13 gives us a treatise on what love really looks like. It uses the term charity, which is the biblical term uh, or the, the Greek word agape, which is the deepest, most sincere form of love. And so he goes into detail there. 1 John chapter 4 also articulates the significance of what God means when he says to love one another. Jesus left that instruction with his disciples in John chapter 13. He says, I'm going to give you a commandment that you love one another. And it's going to be by this token that people are going to understand that you are my disciples because you're going to reflect my love. And that is going to be a signal to those that see that and say, hey, there's something different about this particular individual. Um, we're going to go a little bit further on this as well. But when we talk about true love, love has got to be anchored to the truth. Where love diverges from the truth, there is no actual love. So people talk about love. Um, you know, you see these signs outside, love wins. Well, what kind of love are you talking about? Well, we know what kind of love they're talking about, but that is not the kind of love that actually wins. That's the kind of love that actually loses. It is one that loses the soul in a hopeless vortex of debauchery and evil. That is not love. Love does not allow the object of that love to fall into a trap a pit no matter how sincere they are in wanting it they don't allow it our grandson Kingston he's approaching two years old there's a lot of things that Kingston wants that Kingston should not have the Kingston does not understand that this is harmful this is not something you should put in your mouth This is not something you should put on your hands it's not something you should put on your body there are certain things we simply do not allow him, his parents don't allow him to do, to eat, to breathe, whatever it might be, because we know that it's going to be harmful for him in one way or another, even though that's what he wants. And there are things that we want that are conjured up by our carnal, fleshly nature. It says, you've got to have this to be happy. You need this. And God says, no, no, wait a minute, slow down. I know you want it. I know your sin nature craves it, but it is harmful to you. It will hurt you. Don't go there. That's what we try to do as Christians. We try to share with them the genuine, true love of the Lord Jesus Christ that is predicated upon absolute truth. This is the real thing. Something that is wholesome and decent and perfect. This is what we want you to have. Not what the world is offering. Not what your flesh is craving. Not what Satan is trying to manipulate. Satan brought that same scheme to Eve. He says, this is what you really want. This is what you really desire. You, know, you, you, you will have what you've really been looking for if you just do this. And we know the upshot. We know what happened. And that is what Satan continues to do in hearts and lives today. And he portrays those who stand as an op opposition to this kind of lifestyle as enemies, as intolerant, as uh, hateful people, when it's exactly the opposite. Exactly the opposite. It is the love of God that we're trying to share with these people. That there is a better way. Something that is more wholesome and beneficial if you would but believe us. Just trust that this is what God has for you. So the love of God is the only true love. All other love that, that disconnects itself from God's truth is actually not love. It is not love. And then finally in your notes there, the love of God is inexhaustible. It is inexhaustible. In Romans chapter 8, take a look at Romans chapter 8. Uh, many of you probably have this passage 
highlighted in your Bible. But in Romans 8, verse 35, Paul asks really a rhetorical question. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. You know, from the world's perspective, it sounds like God doesn't love you very much. He's letting you go through all these things. Contrary. You see, God does not think the way we think. God operates on a completely different scale. Completely different level. And Paul is making the observation that yes, while we go through a lot of these torments, a lot of these tribulations, a lot of these distresses and things that, that really afflict us in this life, they're really manifestations of God's love. Because what he is doing is he's removing from us all that is truly harmful and all that we depend upon other than himself. He brings us to a point where we are dependent solely upon him. And sometimes he has to bring these things into our life. And ultimately, he says, we are slain as we're counted as sheep for the slaughter. My mother passed away seven years ago. It's easy to become selfish times like that. God, why'd you take her away? But then you ask yourself, why should I, who am I to withhold from my mother what is actually what God intended for her all along? She was created for fellowship with Him. And now she has fellowship with Him in the purest, truest, most absolute sense. So isn't that selfish of me to say, well, that's not fair? To take, take from her for my selfish needs, what God intended for her to have with Him. See, God wants us with Him, ultimately. And He's preparing us for that moment. He continues on in verse, 37, or verse uh, 38. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. He says nothing, nothing can separate us from that love. So, God's love is inexhaustible. Now let's take a look at some of the attributes, moral attributes, that we can connect directly to the overarching moral attribute of God's love. Number one in parentheses there is grace. Grace. We've already touched on it, but grace simply means unmerited or undeserved favor. In your notes there, we have 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. And in verse 10, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. The God of all grace. Grace is God giving to man what he does not deserve. That's grace. God giving to man what he does not deserve. It is that unmerited, undeserved favor. It is the wellspring of all God's dealings with mankind. Grace it is the wellspring of all God's dealings with mankind. There is nothing that God does not do in relation to man that has has, does not have a connection in some way to His grace. Just getting up this morning is God's grace. Getting here safely today was God's grace. Going home and having food on the table is God's grace. 
being able to see, to hear. And, and even those that cannot, do not have these things, it is still God's grace. All of it is God's grace. It is the currency of our existence, especially as Christians. Apart from God's grace, there is no hope for mankind. None whatsoever. We have several verses I could give you here. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, again, a familiar uh, passage, verses, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Second Timothy, Second Timothy chapter 1, and in verse 9, 2 Timothy 1 and verse 9. Paul writes, Who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Grace is the continuing currency of the Christian experience. You know, we are saved by grace. We are kept by grace. We grow by grace by grace all of it is by God's grace at no point do we divorce ourselves from that currency to where we now move on to something else I'm saved by grace and now I have to do my part no all of it is by God's grace even what I am able to see change in me is by God's grace it is not has nothing to do with me when it has something to do with me God is removed from the picture. It's not grace, it's works. I become a legalistic Christian. I'm saved by grace. I'm on my way to heaven, but I'm living as if grace doesn't matter anymore. That I'm done with grace. I got all the grace I need, now it's up to me. That's not the Christian experience. That is a recipe for failure. That's why Dr. Benjamin, when he would come and be with us, and we continue to pray for him, he and Linda will be moving uh, to Lynchburg, Virginia, to be with uh, their daughter and son-in-law, where they'll be taking care of them probably later this fall. Um, still no changes as to his health, unfortunately. Um, he's in good spirits, has great humor still, uh, but uh, just no energy whatsoever. But he would say, the Christian life is not difficult. It's impossible apart from God's grace. It's impossible. We cannot live the Christian life apart from God's grace. We become frustrated. And I think there's a lot of, I think that's one of the biggest reasons why there are those that say, well, I, I, you know, I, I went to church and I tried all that and it just didn't work out for me. Well, there's two reasons why that's going to happen. Number one, you never accepted God's grace in the first place to become a child of God. And so you never truly understood what it meant to be a child of God. Or two, you did that, but then you started, you started working to try and be a better person, a better Christian, and you got frustrated. And you saw that it's just not working for me. I can't live the way Paul and Peter and all these people live. I, I, it's not working for me. And you get frustrated. You quit. Well, it's because you're not going about it the right way. We have some books in our library there that really underscore a lot of this. Uh, Hudson Taylor's Spiritual Secret. Uh, Watchman Nee, The Normal Christian Life. Books by Tozer on Knowledge of the Holy and the pursuit of God. Uh, these kind of books help to underscore that the Christian life, first and last, is a life experience based upon God's grace. God living through me. Apostle Paul put it this way, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. He says, when you look at me, you do not really see the, the old Paul. 
My desire is that you see Christ. That He is living, pulsing through every fiber of my spiritual being. God's grace is structured according to His holiness. I mean, we have a lot of scriptures that we could take a look at here. I have some in my notes. We've not looked at everything that is here. Let's take a look at a few of these here real quickly with the time that we have. Uh, Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 and verse 2. Speaking of Christ, Paul says, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now he's speaking to Christians. He's talking to those that are already saved, but he says, through that same faith, we have continuing access into this grace. I'm going to use an illustration here, but I think for the sake of time, we'll, uh, we'll move on. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm not going to look at all of these, but I have other scriptures if you are interested in jotting some of these down. Um, actually, let's go, yeah, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, actually. Let's look at that one. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and in verse 9. This is a familiar passage where Paul says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of God, the power of Christ, may rest upon me. We're familiar with the passage. Paul said there was a thorn in the flesh. I wanted it removed. It was troublesome to me. It was a problematic. I didn't like it. So I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And God finally came back with an answer. He said, I'm not going to do that. I just want you to understand that even though you have this thorn in the flesh, my grace is sufficient to carry you through that. I need to keep you humble. I need to keep you dependent upon me. So God's grace is a means of helping us to understand that we need Him 24-7. 24-7. Let's look at the connection between grace and holiness. There's again a box there in Romans chapter 6. We'll go over this real quickly and then touch on a couple more. Grace is not a substitute for holiness. Okay? Romans chapter 5, or 6 rather, a matter of fact, we probably should turn there while we're looking at this. In verse 1, Paul asked the question, again, rhetorical, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Down in verse 15 of the same chapter, he says, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. So just because we are under God's grace does not mean that is a license to break God's law. Grace is not a substitute for holiness. It is a pathway to God's holiness. Grace releases us from bondage to sin. Verses 11 through 14 lay that out for us. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of righteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. So grace provides the medium to break the bondage of that sin. If we're struggling with sin, it is only through God's grace that we can activate the power to have victory over that sin and then grace affords access to God's holiness verses 16 through the end of the chapter access to God's holiness through God's grace we won't read that that portion there but you can jot that down and look at it the second in your notes there let's move quickly here a couple more and then we'll have to stop dealing with the attribute of God's love we have grace 
Number two, we have mercy. Two in parentheses, mercy. Mercy literally means compassion. It means compassion. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, <clears throat> and in verse 3, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. It's speaking of God of mercy. Now what's the difference between grace and mercy? They are similar, they're companion attributes. But the difference I find simply is this, where grace is God giving us what we do not deserve, mercy is God not giving us what we do deserve. God not giving us what we do deserve. Mercy is the other side of and inseparable from God's grace. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. <clears throat> but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. He's putting these two inextricably together. They are inseparable. God's grace and mercy represent the complete package of God's love and opens the door of all God's manifold goodness. Between these two, we have His riches at our disposal. So mercy, compassion, God not giving us what we do deserve. Number three in parentheses. We talk about God's love, we've got to talk about God's peace. The peace of God. Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15 and verse 33. Now the God of peace be with you all. So He's the God of grace. He's the God of mercy. He's the God of peace. God's peace is afforded through His grace and mercy. Matter of fact, whenever you look at peace, it always follows. Whenever there's an introduction or a salutation, Paul says grace and peace. It's always grace and peace. It's never peace and grace. Grace always has to precede peace. There is no peace apart from God's grace. You remove God's grace, you remove God's peace. So if we operate as Christians outside of the realm of God's grace, <coughs> excuse me, we're disobedient, carnal, Peace is removed. It's removed. A couple more things. We'll have to stop here with this. God's peace is connected directly to Christ. You have the scriptures there, John 14, 27. God's peace is not bound by circumstances. Another familiar passage, Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So circumstances and peace actually don't have any direct correlation to the Christian. We often think of it that way. My circumstances affect my peace. But if we are in Christ and we're abiding by His grace, really those circumstances have no bearing whatsoever on my peace. And we have examples throughout the Scripture of that very thing. Where the circumstances are completely extraneous from the peace that was going on in the heart. You, you think of Stephen. Stephen, the first martyr, all of the tumult and savagery around him and there was this tranquility this peace that he had that's because God's peace passes human understanding and then finally in your notes there you already have it God's peace is rooted in his sovereignty it is rooted in his sovereignty I'll read one verse as it's connected here 
Uh, I'm already in chapter 15 of Romans. He says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. So, peace is a gift of God that comes through our relationship with Jesus Christ. His grace and His mercy afford us that peace. We're going to stop with this, and Lord willing, come back and pick up next Sunday. Let's close in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for the Word of God and pray that You'd bless as we continue to study about You from the Word of God. Have a greater appreciation, greater awe and respect for the King of kings and Lord of lords. And Father, we pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, we'll take a...